Welcome to Spiritual Psychology. My name is Renee Lavallee McKenna. I'm a therapist and shamanic healer. And today I want to talk about anxiety as my teacher. I've had a kind of existential anxiety most of my life, and it has caused me to grow probably more than any other thing, person, or experience in my life. And when I consider anxiety as my teacher, I'm expanding the definition of the word teacher to include anything that helps me to grow or learn or develop myself, because that's what a good teacher does. And there's a difference between a good teacher and a nice teacher. (laughs) And I have to say, even in school, my best teachers were not always the nice teachers. I might have liked the nice teachers better, but for me, it was really the classes that challenged me, forced me to work hard and push against my own edges to really learn stuff to really expand myself, those were the places I learned the most. And the same is true in my life. Some of the greatest teachers I've had in human form have been my most difficult relationships. My mother, my stepmother, my abusive boyfriend, my spiritual teacher who disappointed me, my child on the autism spectrum. And anxiety has been present in every one of those situations. When I work with clients, I often take what's called an emotional biography, and ask them how they felt most days at different stages of their life. And when I look back at myself, my earliest memories of my felt experience are fear. And I'm happy to report that today, I very rarely have fear and anxiety. In fact, it feels clear to me that one of the main benefits of growing up, maturing, and evolving is that our fear dissolves. And in my own recent therapy session, I made myself a promise to actively dissolve the remaining existential anxiety that I have because it doesn't serve any good purpose anymore. At different times in my life, it's been a protective device, particularly when I was young. Fear is a survival skill, looking for danger, trying to keep me safe. I don't want to be safe anymore. I'm done with safe. I'm done with being domesticated and dedicating the next 30 years of my life or however many I have left to being my most wild and authentic self, I strive to be fearless. Because you know, life is fatal. None of us gets out of here alive. What is there to be afraid of? Everything that I could be afraid of, I've actually already lived through in my life. (laughs) I've already had tremendous failure and tremendous success. And both of those things can be scary. So I wanna be done with fear. Because the idea is that it keeps me safe, but generally it just keeps me small. It stops me from telling the whole truth, from completely opening my heart, from taking risks and doing interesting, new, exciting, creative things. Fear stops me from going into the unknown, and the unknown is where all new things happen. Now, certainly fear and anxiety have their place. Like all feelings, they're information. But the information of fear and anxiety is generally only valid if it's rooted in the present moment. Is there something scary happening right now? And if there is, then fear can give me energy to actually take constructive action. Get out of the way of the moving car, cross the street from the creepy, crazy guy. But most of the time, anxiety is about some fantasy projection about the future. And certainly right now, a major source of anxiety is the looming unknown on the other side of the pandemic and our desire to have the illusion of control over the future. And fear of the unknown is hardwired into us from hunter-gatherer days entering new territory. There might be predators or enemies we have to watch out for. But in reality, the future is always unknown. And we can see that as scary, or we can see that as hopeful. And the more grounded we are in the present moment, the better equipped we are to make healthy, constructive choices to co-create our future, because we do co-create it. Our experience and how our life unfolds is constructed by the thousand million choices we make every day in our life. And do we want to make those choices from a place of fear or from a place of faith? Do we choose from pessimism or from hope? There's a really simple practice, so simple it might give an eye roll, which is just to be where your feet are right now. And is there anything scary or threatening happening in this moment? Usually not. And I think the Dalai Lama refers to this when he says, 
If you have fear of some pain or suffering, you should examine whether there is anything you can do about it. If you can, there is no need to worry about it. If you cannot do anything, then there is still no need to worry. But that's the Dalai Lama in the Buddhist idea that feelings arise and they fall away like clouds passing in the sky and that it's our attachment or our aversion, our desire and grasping or our defense against them that causes the suffering. There's an acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. I love acronyms. In fact, my two favorite acronyms for fear really speak to the two ways that we can manage fear in our life. Avoidance or embrace. Fear can stand for fuck everything and run or face everything and recover. I've done both. In fact, I've done just about everything you can to try to run away from fear and it's like a shadow. I saw this great video of this little girl who had just started walking and she saw her shadow for the first time and it scared her and she was screaming and running away from it until she fell down. Adorable, funny, and we all do it because fear is like our own shadow. Fear is our own shadow and running away from it doesn't work. Now in the Vedanta tradition, you can separate yourself from it to notice it and name it and disown it as a part of yourself. There's my fear. We put it on the table. It's not me. That's one approach. It can certainly relieve our felt sensation and that's a practice, but that practice hasn't worked very well for me. It tends to jump back off the table and get back on my shoulder (laughs) or down in the pit of my stomach. So I'm a fan of facing it, embracing it. How do I turn toward my anxiety and ask it, what are you here to teach me? What are you trying to show me? What within me needs to be healed and transformed? That's the question. And difficult feelings are almost always a doorway to healing. So how do we step through the doorway of fear? How do we turn toward it and embrace it and receive the information, the teaching, the gifts that it has to offer us? I love Thich Nhat Hanh's practice of looking deeply. And if we look deeply at our fear in the present moment, if it's present moment fear, then there's often action that needs to be taken, like getting out of the way of the moving car. But if we look deeply at our fear and there is no danger in the present moment, then it's generally about the future. And it's a particular projection into the future. Generally, fear is an experience in our past that we don't want to repeat, that we project into the future because we're afraid it's going to happen again or something worse. So we want to protect ourselves from getting hurt and we can make up all the scenarios of what could go wrong There's some idea that that is protective. I call it pre-feeling. I've done it a lot in my life as a highly defended person. It's like in Kung Fu or Karate when you practice these moves over and over again so that if you ever get attacked, you can just do it. (laughs) I've done that a lot in my life, trying to practice my defensive moves with other people so that if they do something that I don't like, then I can and defend myself. (laughs) Ah, It's terrible because actually what ends up happening is that I'm in this defensive place all the time and it could be a perfectly great day and everything could be really good. And in my internal experience, I'm being attacked or abandoned or whatever terrible thing I think is going to happen. Eckhart Tolle talks about that a lot in The Power of Now. The idea that we're actually crazy and we're not living in reality, that we live in these mental constructs in our head, and most of them are negative. And anxiety is indicative of that. Generally, the past projected into the future. So the problem with projecting the past into the future is that it can actually create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think we know that, and that adds to our anxiety. So for example, if I'm always prepared for my lover to leave me, then I'm not going to be in my best self. I'm not going to be fully present. I'm not going to be open-hearted with them. And that whole defensive thing that's happening for me emotionally and energetically, spiritually, sexually, creatively, that affects my relationship. In fact, on a subtle level, it could even create the very thing that I'm afraid is going to happen. Now, there's a safety in that. 
Because the ego likes to think it knows what's going to happen and then it's smart. But you know, do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? I'd rather be happy. And happiness and contentment can really only be found in the present moment, living deeply, vulnerably, and open-heartedly so I can receive all the things that life has to offer me and I can respond to them with my best self. If I'm responding from fear, I'm almost always in a patterned, habitual, defensive place that's frequently a generator of the very negative patterns I want to get away from. Now, we're trying our best, but most of us live just in our mind, in our intellect, and it's very limited, smart as it may be, because the experiences that it's trying to mitigate and manage are emotional, they're energetic, they're body-centered, they're spiritual, they're sexual, they're relational. Those are really different operating systems within our holistic structure. I like the idea of the body as a metaphor for our entire being and that we have different systems. So physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, energetic, social, relational. You could keep going and divide them out, but those are the basic ones. And within our body, we have our digestive system, we have our pulmonary system, we have our nervous system, we have our epidural system, our muscular and skeletal system. They each have a function in service of the whole. You can't actually compartmentalize them out. If you just had bones, you would have a skeleton, you wouldn't have a human. And if there's an issue in one of those subsystems, then it needs to be addressed in the appropriate way for that subsystem. But the pulmonary system can't digest food. And the digestive system can't move my limbs around like my muscular skeletal system can. So the intellect, the rational mind, can't actually heal our emotional, spiritual, energetic, even our physical issues. Those need to be addressed directly, just like we would set a bone if it was broken or eat different food if we have digestive issues. So when we think about facing our fear, about turning toward it, looking deeply at it, we'll generally find it's rooted in some unhealed experience from our past. Now, the development of the human psyche is a constructive process, and that's good news and bad news. So the good news is it's very plastic. It can always be deconstructed and reconstructed. It's very malleable. I know this from my own experience because the way that I process the world now is entirely different than it was 30 years ago. And it doesn't take 30 years to restructure it. I can tell you right now, actually, the way I'm processing things is vastly different than it was two years ago, because a lot of things have happened in the last two years. And those things have encouraged or forced me to do some very deep, reconstructive work that's been really beneficial. It can happen at any time. So that's the good news. Construction, just like on a house. You don't like the deck? Tear it off. You want to build an addition? Go ahead. Does it take time and resources? It does. But is it possible? Absolutely. Depends where you want to put your time and resources. And resources don't necessarily mean money, although it could. So the bad news is, in the constructive process of the human psyche, as things happen to us, just like in building a house, if there's problems with the foundation, it can cause problems in every other area of the house. If the plumbing isn't incorrectly, the wiring's faulty, you could burn the house down. You could see that. <laughs> That's a really great metaphor, actually, for dysfunction in our life. Now, you might need to go and dig up the foundation. Or you might just have some problems with the decorations in the living room. Or maybe there's some windows that need replaced in the dining room. But we have to look deeply and see where the problem is. I suppose enough time's gone by for me to be able to tell this story. It's very interesting that the physical world is often a metaphor for the non-physical world. So in 2002... I got married, I got pregnant, and we added 1,300 square feet to our house in San Francisco. And at the very end of that project, when they were just about ready to put the sheetrock up, I came to the house with my new baby. It was a rainy day. I came here by myself to see what they were doing. And the workmen had gone. In fact, it was their last day there for those who had done the exterior. So the house was all closed up, as they say. And I was horrified because it was actually raining into my new downstairs bedroom and bathroom. (gasps) Oh my God, I'm there with my infant strapped to the front of me in a baby pack, and there's water pouring down between the open studs, 
And I called the contractor, I called my husband, and by the time everybody got there, which was probably the next day, it wasn't raining anymore. And they thought I was crazy. They flooded the deck that's above the room. We couldn't find the source of the leak. And then we went into a drought and it didn't rain for a couple years. And I thought, oh, maybe it magically healed itself. We always hope things will magically heal themselves, just like our anxiety. Maybe it magically healed itself because I haven't been in a sexual relationship in seven years. Oh, (laughs) and then you get in a sexual relationship and all the anxiety comes back. So it started to rain and it started to rain inside my new house. And we tried everything to fix that leak. The leak was built in to the structure. Mike's husband works in construction. He's incredibly competent at fixing stuff. The dude can fix anything, usually within five minutes without even getting dirty. In San Francisco, we have a rainy season, so for eight months of the year, it didn't rain. And we would again always hope that the leak had magically healed and then the rainy season would come. And mold started to grow on my walls and it ruined my woodwork and it wrecked my floor and the ceiling fell in. Ugh. And we tried and we tried and we tried to fix that leak. Just like we tried and tried and tried to fix some of the core issues in our marriage. Diligently tried. The marriage was very successful, just like my house is very beautiful. And after 17 years, it was time to separate because of the built-in problems. And we hired a contractor to fix the leak in the house as part of our very friendly divorce agreement. And in three weeks of work, they fixed the leak that we could never fix. And you know, I had a really nice talk with my ex-husband this week. We get along so good, and the leak has been fixed between us as well. So structural issues that need to be reconfigured. So if you're dealing with anxiety, you can have a couple drinks of wine at night. You can binge on Netflix. You can self-soothe with porn or shopping. You can smoke pot. You can get addicted to Oxycontin. You can shoot heroin. You can drink more coffee, which always makes your anxiety worse. Just saying. Or you can look deeply and face your fear. And it's so much more simple and accessible than you might think. Forget the narrative about it. Forget the stories that your head tells you about why. They might be interesting, entertaining, tragic. They're not helpful. If you have anxiety, take a moment right now and bring your awareness into your body. And notice where that anxiety lives in your body. Is it a clenching throat? A tight chest? A pit in your stomach, bring your awareness there and ask a very simple question. How old is the part of myself that's feeling that fear or anxiety right now? Just the first thing that comes up. No story, no narrative. How old is that little boy or little girl that's afraid? Three, six, ten? Maybe you had a trauma later in life. Sixteen, thirty-two. Bring your awareness to that part of yourself that's frightened. See if you can sense or feel or imagine them in the room with you right now. And that's the work. That's the past projecting into the future. And if we heal the past, we can be in the present, which will create a different future than the one we could imagine from our wounded self. When we can bring our best adult self and turn it toward our own fear, bring love and care, compassion and presence to our own unresolved emotional wounds, We reconstruct the house. It doesn't have to take 30 years. Sometimes it only takes 30 minutes. Sometimes we have to do it over and over. Now, if your house needs a lot of reconstruction, there may be a lot of wounds to face, but you only need to do them one at a time. You can trust your own psyche, and the thing that comes up first is the thing that wants to be healed first. There's a wisdom within our own intuitive self that knows the order of operations. Just like the contractor knew how to fix the leak, we couldn't fix. This is called inner child work. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to a really powerful process. It takes about 25 minutes. Feelings are a digestive process. They help us extricate the nutrients of an experience and excrete the rest. And when we defend ourselves against our feelings, it's like being constipated. There's a natural process you can trust but you have to participate with it. It's not about re-experiencing what already happened. You already did that once. It's about letting it flow through you and bring it into the present moment so that you can be more whole, more present, 
more compassionate to yourself and others, to have more power in resources, to make constructive choices in all areas of your life. So turn toward your fear. It's your teacher. And ask it, what are you here to teach me today? Blessings on your path. Until we meet again, this is Renee LaValle McKenna for Spiritual Psychology.